An agreement? Yes. A covenant is a promise. Part of the covenant, the two parties agree that certain activities will or will not be carried <coughs> out. In a literal sense, the covenant means a binding agreement, a legal contract between two parties. A bit like buying a house. Um, it's a promise. It can be an agreement. It can be... Um, contract but from a biblical perspective the word covenant comes from the same root word meaning to cut so that's interesting isn't it meaning to cut this means that in the culture of the bible I pick my notes covenant carried weight and was often cut or sealed in blood so for example in Leviticus 17 in the Old Testament we see that the blood of oxen was sprinkled on the altar and sometimes it was even sprinkled on people. Ooh. The blood of animals was shed as a sacrifice for their sins and blood represents life, doesn't it? Without blood, you don't have life, do you? So there are seven types of covenant in the Bible. There's the Adamic covenant. I better go really quick, I think, because I've only got 15 minutes. <coughs> So, thank you. Next one. So there was the Adamic covenant. This covenant um, was a covenant of works because it was based on the principle of Adam's obedience to God. And it was the first covenant made with Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall. Um, you can read about it in Genesis 2, verses 15 to 17. I'll just skip that because we haven't got a lot of time. Then there was the Naomi covenant. That was the covenant that God made with Noah and um, he established that after the flood in which he resets and renews the blessings of creation. So he said that never again will all life be cut off by waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And, um, and he set a rainbow in the clouds and the rainbow was a sign of the covenant between man and the earth. And so every time you see a rainbow you can we remember, I think, I do anyway, I think of Noah, I think of the flood and I, and it doesn't matter how many, you know, floods we hear about, God's never going to flood the whole earth, even though there, it might rain and rain and rain and rain, he's not going to flood the earth, yeah. So the descendants of, of Noah were commanded with seven rules and uh, they were, they weren't allowed to commit adultery, they weren't allowed to blaspheme God, there was no idolatry, no bloodshed, no theft and eating the blood of animals, of a living animal, was prohibited. So things have changed a lot since then, haven't they? Then there was the Abrahamic covenant. And this was the covenant between Abraham and God. And it consisted of three parts. The promised land, the promise of descendants, and the promise of blessings and redemption. And you can read about that in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. Then we have the Mosaic Covenant. This was the covenant that God established with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai after he had led them out of Egypt and out of slavery. So with it, God supplies the law that was meant to govern and shape the people of Israel in the Promised Land. And you can read about that in Exodus, from Exodus 19 right through to Exodus 24. And then there was the Davidic Covenant it was the covenant where God promised a descendant of David to reign on the throne over the people of God. And you can read about that in 2 Samuel verse 7. But the final and last covenant that I know of anyway is the new and everlasting covenant. And that is where God promises that he will forgive sin, he will restore communion with those whose hearts believe in Jesus in John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish and have everlasting life. And um, that's a beautiful covenant that God has given us. In Luke 22, verse 19 to 20, it says, And he took bread, and when he gave thanks, 
He broke it and gave to them, saying, This is my body. This is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This is the cup poured out for you. It is the covenant, new covenant is in my blood. So often um, blood is mentioned in covenants or blood is involved in covenants. So Jesus was the mediator of the new covenant and his death on the cross was the basis of the promise of the new covenant. He defeated death by his resurrection and restored life for those who believe in him. So if we believe in Jesus, we get new life. Jesus, through his own blood shed on the cross, he established that new covenant with us, with God's people. We are God's people. The covenant's been established with us. And it's not a covenant that is one of law, but it's one of grace. And it's a covenant in which God's people are born again, made new creatures, and delight in God and in the law. So we're made new creations in Christ. Jesus is the fulfilment of all the covenants in scripture. So every single one of those covenants that I've mentioned, Jesus is the fulfillment of all of those, every single one of them. So what are the blessings of the new covenant? The blessings are forgiveness of sins, empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and the knowledge of God inscribed in our hearts. Scripture talks about that. In Romans 8 verse 17, he tells us that God's children under the new covenant his heirs and joint heirs with Christ. What are the benefits of the new covenant? Well, our sins are all together and forever forgiven. Past, present and future, all our sins are forgiven. In Hebrews 12, 8 verse 12 it says, For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins. No more. God does not remember our sins. I know we do. I have trouble with that. But God does not remember them. Isn't it good? Imagine if we could just wipe those sins out of our minds and we would never remember them again. That's how God is. He doesn't remember them. Um, unfortunately, we do, but we need to make an effort not to remember them, don't we? Once we've asked for forgiveness, they're gone. They're, the slate's wiped clean. So what are the benefits of the new covenant? I think I just read that, did I? No? I said the blessings. The benefits are that we're forever forgiven. It's not just a a thing of the present, it's forever. Jesus died so that our sins, all our sins are forever forgiven. In Hebrews 8 verse 12 it says, For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. So we know it's in scripture. We've found new freedom in being forgiven. It can set you free when you know that you've been forgiven, when you truly know. Sometimes we need a revelation of that. And um, if you need a revelation of that, come and see us and talk to us and we'll pray for you. God's given me revelations of things I needed and he can do that for you too. The thing I needed a revelation of most about the most was that God actually loved me. I found that very hard to accept. Um, and God gave me a revelation of that and he can give you a revelation of the fact that your sins are forgiven if that's what you need. So some of the Bible verses about um, the new covenant are in, and I don't think I'll read them all, they're in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Actually, I might read that one because that's a really good one. Um, So behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, Well, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, Though I was their husband, declares the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, describes the Lord, declares the Lord, sorry. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbour and each brother say, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. That's really precious. Um, And then Hebrews 9, verse 15, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25. I'll read that one out. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And that's 
why we have communion every church service, almost every church service, so that we remember the covenant that was where Jesus shed his blood for us, the covenant that was made for us for the forgiveness of our sins. And in Mark 14, 24, he says, this is the, my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, poured out for everyone. Not everyone accepts it, but it's poured out for everyone. So what can we experience as part of the new covenant? What can we experience personally? In Acts 2 verses 1 to 4 it says we can have dreams and visions. In Acts 17 it says we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts, um, in verse 32 it says the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit will come upon us and fill us. And in verse 38, it talks about repentance and being baptised in the name of Jesus and being filled with the Spirit. So that's talking about water baptism, but also baptism of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit renews us and, and fills us. There are some more scriptures up there that you can look them up yourself. So um, how God commits to us is different to how we commit to God. And the reason why is because we're just human. We're, we're just plain human beings. But God is God, isn't he? And he is almighty. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. He's all seeing. He's all giving. He is just and he is good to us. And he is everywhere at the same time. He's here. He's over the road. He's at my house. He's at your house. He's everywhere at the same time. And God's commitment to us is out of the ordinary. It's not an ordinary commitment that we might have, say, in a marriage or something. His commitment to us as ordinary is is out of the ordinary because he gave us his son, his only son, Jesus. He's given us his Holy Spirit and he's given us unconditional love. He loves each one of us unconditionally. And when God makes a promise, he keeps it. Have you ever made a promise and not kept it? I'm sure we all have. But God doesn't do that. When God makes a promise, he keeps it. And we can see that throughout the whole Bible, that God has fulfilled all his promises. So when God is committed to doing something, he will do it. Sometimes we say we're committed to doing something and we don't follow through, perhaps like in a marriage, um, in a relationship, in, in a lot of situations, in jobs. Whereas God's different when he is committed to something and he's committed to us. And we can see that throughout the Bible, that he is committed to us. Even when we can't see what God is doing for us, he is committed to us. He never gives up on us. And even when we don't deserve it, and often we don't deserve it, but God is still committed to us. He still loves us <coughs> and he still forgives us. He's a good God and he's so patient with us. Um, I don't know about you, but I get impatient sometimes and I wonder why God doesn't get impatient with me. But he doesn't. God is patient. He's so patient with us. He's always ready to receive us back again when we've wandered away. He's always ready to, to show us his love and, and to bless us. And he blesses us abundantly. He's just. God is just. In Psalm verse 145, verse 17, it says, The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. And in Deuteronomy 32 verse 4 it says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. And Psalm 89 verse 14 says, God is just. It is a part of his character. So he's always just. It'd be good if there was justice in the world, wouldn't it? But the only justice there is is in God. He's patient. When he makes a promise, he will fulfil it. He always fulfils his promises and he's faithful to do that. In Hebrews 10 verse 23, it says, We can trust God and maintain our faith in him because God is always faithful to keep his promises. Look at Abraham. He was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. That was his first son. He was 100 years old when Isaac was born and he was 99 years old when the Lord spoke to him about establishing a covenant with him, saying that he would multiply him exceedingly and he would become the father of a host of nations. A hundred years old, can you imagine 
waiting to your 86 to have your first child. <laughs> That's incredible, isn't it? God does not tell us he is doing one thing and then act like another. He is true to his words, so he doesn't say one thing and then like he doesn't say I love you and then, and then you feel like he's abandoned you because he doesn't abandon you, he loves you. He doesn't um, say I'll provide for you, I'll provide for all your needs and then not provide for your needs. I can testify to that, God's always provided for all my needs. God is committed to us and he never gives up on us. You know, I don't know about you, but I've given up on people sometimes. And um, I think we all do sometimes. We give up. We give up on people, we give up on things, we give up on goals, we give up on dreams. But God doesn't give up on anything or anyone and he certainly doesn't give up on us. Jesus often spoke in parables to help us understand this, knowing that some would not accept him and they would not get it, but believers would. And some of those parables were the parable of the lost coin. Even if I read about that in Luke 15, verses 8 to 20, when um, the woman has lost a coin and she just searches and searches and searches. And we might think it's only one coin, but in those days that coin was worth a lot of money. That was worth a lot to her. That was all that she had. And so she searched. And in the same way, um, it says in verse 10, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels over one lost sinner who repents. And so the parable of the lost coin is referring to uh, sinners who are lost and people coming to God. God never gives up. He just keeps searching and searching. He keeps touching us. He keeps leading us and guiding us until we come to him. And there's the parable of the lost sheep in Matthew 18 and Luke 15, where the shepherd leaves the 99 to look for the one lost sheep. You'd think he'd be worried about a wolf getting one of the 99 or one of them getting lost, but he's not. He's just focused on that one lost sheep and he's going out to <coughs> find him and that's how, how God is with us. That's how God is with sinners. He's, he, he tries to... He finds us. He tries to draw us in. He leads us and guides us. And sometimes it takes us a while to get it, but God will always go after the one lost sheep. And then the prodigal son is another one where um, God welcomes the son or the lost son or daughter home when they've wandered away. The prodigal son just, you know, took all of his inheritance, went away, spent a lot. And when he came back, he'd think the father would have been angry with him, but he wasn't. He just welcomed him home and, and had a big feast. And that's how God is with a lost sinner. He just loves everyone. And um, when they come to him, he rejoices. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you future and a hope. And that's God's plan for us, is to give us hope and to give us a future. I was in a situation once where I, um, over a period of time, I lost my hope, and it's not a nice place to be. It's a horrible place to be. And um, God slowly drew me back in. Um, that's only because I was stubborn. <laughs> I was rebellious. <laughs> it took me a while. I think I was away for about, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years. And um, I can remember reading that scripture that God had, a, had plans to give me hope and to give me a future. I couldn't see a future for myself at that time. God is committed to us. In Deuteronomy 31 verse 8 it says he never leaves us nor forsakes us. So even though we might leave him and we might not read his word, we might not go to church anymore, we might not have fellowship with other Christians, we might, we might be wandering on a different path. Um, he doesn't leave us and he doesn't forsake us. It's us leaving him. He does not leave us. God is always for us. He will guide us back to him. Things will happen that will make us think about him and we'll want to come back to him and want to come back to um, church. And like I said, I can testify that God slowly drew me back in. He kept showing me things. He kept leading me. He spoke to me through his word. I wasn't reading the word, but he'd bring it to my remembrance. And um, 
my life was not in a good place. It was going further and further downhill when I moved away from God. And I realised, I came to a point where I realised that I needed to come back to God. I needed to go back to his church and, and start reading his word again. So don't look at your circumstances. Our circumstances can be pretty horrid sometimes. Um, we need to look at God's word. If Abraham had been looking at his circumstances instead of looking at God, he would have given up, but he didn't. Abraham's success with God was based on three things. His obedience, his giving, and his faith. Jesus said, do you know that we would do greater things than he did? Some of the healings that took place when he ministered to people and some of the miracle, miraculous signs were that he walked on water, he cast out demons, he fed thousands of people with only two fish and five loaves. He raised the dead, healed the blind, healed the deaf and the mute. The crippled man at the pool was completely healed and many, many more. The disciples also prayed for many people who were healed. They prayed for the sick and, um, and saw them healed. And we can do the same thing. That's our commission is to bring people to Christ, but also to go out, share the gospel, but also to heal, pray for people, heal people. You know, anybody can do that. God is so committed to us that he will work through us to bring people to him, but he will also work through us to see people healed, delivered and set free. If you come across someone, I do this in my shop even, come across someone who's sick, someone who's got... Um, a real need, we can pray for them. We can, you know, and God will work. I've, I've seen God do some pretty miraculous things. He's done them in my own life, but I've seen him do them in other people's lives when I've prayed for them. And he'll do exactly the same three thing through each one of you. Not one of us here doesn't know God. And so every one of us can be used by God. It's not dependent on our confidence. It's commend. It's um, dependent on God's commitment to us and God working through us. It's got nothing to do with us. So we don't have to think, well, I can't pray for someone, nothing will happen because I'm not good enough, because it's not about us being good enough. It's about us being dependent on God and allowing him to work through us. So if anyone's got a need this morning, please come and ask someone to pray for you this morning. We'd love to pray for you. If you've got a health need, we'd love to pray for that. You know, God might not have healed you the first time, but it could be the second time or the third time that someone prays for you that you get healed. So come to God and, and ask for healing. Come to someone, ask someone to pray for you. Sometimes we can be so independent, and I know I can be like that, <laughs> and we don't ask to be prayed for. We think, oh, I'll just pray for my, at myself. But God wants us to be dependent on other Christians as well as on him. He wants us to work together to bless one another and to pray for one another and to meet each other's needs. And um, he's, he's a good God and he's faithful. And through the covenant of Jesus' blood that was poured out for us, we can have all those things. We have forgiveness of sins. We can have healing. And God's given us his Holy Spirit to as a seal of his promise. So, let's just pray. Father, we just come before you and we thank you that you're a good God. We thank you, Father, that you are committed to us. Father, it doesn't matter how far, how far we move away from you, you always draw us back. You're always there for us, Father God. You've always loved us. You care for us. And you want what's good for us. So, Father, we just commit our way to you now. We thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your forgiveness, for your love. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.